Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambod, and I have a very special guest, a VP VIP. I have the VP himself, Tyler Mannion. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you, Hani. Great to be here. Yeah, brother. I mean, we talked about it for a while. Uh, you've been coming in and out of Dallas now because of nationals, and then we have the Texas Pro. Yep. And we've been talking about getting you in here to do the Truth Podcast. And so I really appreciate it. I know you're super busy. You made it out here with you, your dad, um, your mom, you got Etela, and then Sandy. So, and special shout out to Sandy Williamson. It's her birthday. Yep. So happy birthday, Sandy. She's been around for many, many years, um, doing an amazing job for the NPC, IFBB Pro League. But I do want to say it's been a kind of a crazy day today. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. especially you showing up at the seminar and Hottie's with you. It, yes, yes. So for those of you that don't know, Hadi Chopin has made it to U.S. soil the first time he's ever been here to prepare for the Mr. outside of the Mr. Olympia at a show. So he had signed up for the Arnold Classic and he got his U.S. visa finally. Uh, for A lot of people thought it wasn't going to happen because of all the turmoil in the Middle East. Um, he was jammed up in Dubai for over two weeks and uh, everybody kind of pushed through, and I'm just uh, want very, very thankful that we were able to get him over here. Um, so shout out to everybody over at the U.S. consulate in Dubai. I know that doing the, a lot of the paperwork is tough because you have so many different people applying, and there's so many different things going on. But I know that uh, they understood that it was also under a tight timeline to get him out here. So again, um, Hadi literally just got off the plane, and he's like, Hey, I know you're doing a seminar. Let's go. Yep. And I was like, you sure you want to go? You just got off of a 16 hour flight. And he said, absolutely. Let's go check it out. And so, he, you know, we were there and then yeah. <laughs> your eyes lit up. It was great. I was like, wow. Cause you were just telling me like, it could be any day. We yep. don't know when he's going to come yep. in. And then this morning you come in, you come walk in and everybody's like, oh my gosh, is that hottie? Yeah. So yeah. The, the seminar got super excited. It was super cool. I know that was a highlight for a lot of people there just to see, you know, he didn't even take his shirt off. He just lifted it up, hit a couple poses with the t-shirt and everybody was going crazy. So yeah, it was really cool. So you never know, guys, when you have these NPC shows, <laughs> you never know who's going to show up. Even Mr. Olympia, exactly. 2022, 2022, Mr. Olympia, Hadi Chopin, uh, just straight off of the airplane. And I was running late and fairness tells me, he's just like, she's like, you're gonna be late for your seminar. I said, I think they'll be okay with it <laughs> because yeah. I'm bringing a special guest, you know, and it's not Cameron because yeah. Cameron was pretty, <laughs> thinks he's pretty special. But, um, but yeah. And then we had a great dinner with Sandy last night, um, you know, to celebrate Sandy's birthday and you guys got an earful from my son. Oh man. He's, he's unbelievable. You never believe he was 10. He's, <laughs> he's ready to judge. He's ready to interview. He's ready to do anything in the industry. And he's sharp too. He's really sharp. I love listening to him talk about judging. He could, he could be a judge. I mean, you know, what's funny is that I've had so many judges tell me that after they speak to him because he comes over and he's like, what did you think about so-and-so separation? And you're like, wait a minute, who, you know, who am I talking to? Yeah. Here? Not a 10 year old. Yeah. And um, so it's funny because he had, he's so just in tuned with physiques because he studies it. He goes on YouTube and watches the videos of all the prior competitions. And then he'd come back and he would come over and he goes, dad, can you tell me why you thought this guy won the Mr. Olympia? And I'm like, who are you talking about? He's like, oh, okay, well, with Ronnie Coleman this year, and then I heard it was close, but it wasn't close. You know, it was the year <laughs> against like Kevin Lebroni. Yeah. Right. And then he's like, it wasn't close. Why are people saying it's close? And I go, I don't know. What do you think? And he goes, I think it's clickbait, Dad. I, I think, think it's, it's clickbait. <laughs> 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 he, that's the best thing. He's he's no filter. He's not pulling any punches. He's gonna let you know what he thinks. It's funny because it actually like reminds me of what I used to do to my grandpa. Right. Like right. I would look at the magazines and Paul like. I don't understand. This guy was in seventh place. It looks better than the three guys that are ahead of him. What, what are you talking about? I said, I'm just telling you what I'm seeing from the thing, you know? But it's the same thing as a little kid. You're just saying, I don't understand this. Like, I don't think that looks better. But it was to just talk to him, actually. I love it. I think it's super cool how knowledgeable he actually is about the sport already. Well, and what's cool is the fact that I think, you know, and I, I didn't know if JM was serious or not. But and JM's here in the room, your dad. And I've known your dad for going on over 25 years. It's one of those things that he says to me, he goes, oh, I think we want him to do some interviews. And I'm like, you know, you're kidding. And he's like, no. <laughs> like, for NPC. So who knows? We might get him to do a little bit yeah, of interviews. Yeah, oh, it'd be great. He's got some questions in there. But it reminds me of you. Yeah. Because when I was growing up and I was like into bodybuilding, I was in awe of all of these things. But when you started coming up, there's a lot of different questions I have for you, but it starts out with, 
you're so dialed in to so many famous people within the bodybuilding community. And I saw you when you were just like four or five years old when I was in Pittsburgh and I was at all of these shows. So when we were the North Americans and we were at all of these other shows, I mean, even um, uh, when North Americans weren't there, but we were just coming in for uh, your grandpa's show at the, the pro um, Pittsburgh pro. And we would come in there and then we'd see you and you were, you know, Cameron's 10, you were like five at yeah. the time. And so, and now you're about to turn 30. Yes. Okay. You're going to turn a big three zero pretty soon here. And how does it feel just always being around bodybuilding? Is it something that you've always enjoyed or is it something that kind of you have to segregate between work and just like, I don't want to really deal with this because it's such a part of your life? I mean, I've always enjoyed bodybuilding. Um, like I loved, I love to be around the shows, right? I remember the first show that I can like actually remember anything about was we were in New Orleans for the GNC show of strength. And that's when Gunther beat Ronnie. And I didn't understand at the time, like everybody was going insane because Gunther had obviously beat him. Right. And I, I, you know, didn't, I didn't grasp like how, how big of a deal that was, but I remember like, you know, watching the show and like, I knew who Ronnie was. He was the man, he was the best. And I was like, Oh, I can't believe like he lost. But then it was a huge deal. So that's the first show that I actually physically remember, like watching and remembering the result. So yeah, that was what, 2002 maybe. So yeah, yeah I was like eight years old then, you know, seven or eight years old. So no, I've always enjoyed it. And I mean, even like if, if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be doing what I was doing. So like funny enough is my first Olympia that I went to was the year that Jay came back and won 2009. So that year I was in, I was 14. I was 14. I was a freshman in high school. And that was your first Olympia. That was my first Olympia that I went to. And I, when I went, I asked my grandpa, hey, you know, do you mind if I can just follow you around the whole weekend? You know? Uh -huh. So, because I always look up to my grandpa, obviously. I've been in the car. I'm listening to his conversations. Between him and my dad, it, it would depend who would take me to which wrestling practice throughout the week. So, switching off all the time. But I'm hearing all his conversations with all these different people. Sometimes I knew their voices. I didn't even know what their face looked like. But I'm listening to, you know, how he's handling everything and doing everything. So... I asked him if I could follow him around, and like at that show, I was that was the last show that Joe Weider was actually at, the last Olympia that Joe was at. So I got to go around with him. I got to meet Joe. I got to meet Betty. I got to go around with him. I just sat, you know, next to him or in the corner of all of his meetings and everything else. And he's like, at the end of the week, and he's like, oh, you know, how was it? And I was like, oh, I loved it. I was like, well, I'm, I'm just going to tell you something. I want to do what you do. He's like, oh, really? I said, yeah, I want to do what you do. I want your job. That's what I told him. I was like, I, I want to. You said do that to, to, to yeah, your grandpa. Yeah, you, you can ask him after that weekend. So he told me, like, of course, you know, everybody, you got to get good grades still. You got to focus on wrestling. You got to do this, that, whatever else. But he's like, if you do all that, then then I'll start teaching you. And then by the time I was a senior in high school that summer and everything else, I started, you know, going with him to every single thing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And what did you think of your first Olympia? Was it something that was kind of like, did it blow you away in regards to seeing Jay and Branch and all them? And obviously that was a big Olympia. Oh, because yeah, that it, was, was a, it was a huge Olympia. And Jay Cutler yeah. was always my favorite bodybuilder. So seeing him like come back and win like that, I remember when he came out and I was like, over. You know, as, <laughs> as, soon, as, he, as soon as he came out, I was like, yeah, it's, that, that, that's over. And I was sitting, you know, with my grandpa. So Steve and Samuel, the judges are up there. And <laughs> like, like Cameron, right? I'm, you know, sitting there giving my opinion and, you know, Dexter had won the year before and, you know, I, I love Branch too. You know, I love Branch. Let me say, I love, I love Branch. But when I looked at their physiques that year, I said, I know Branch is crazy, like condition, but Dexter's still like to me so, so much better. My grandpa <laughs> didn't really like hearing my opinion that loudly, you know, like, well, what do I know? I'm just, wow. I can't believe that, you know, you guys are, think Dexter is better or Branch is better than Dexter here. I got like, you know, the look from him. He's like, what? Steve, I remember Steve turned around and like tried like not to laugh. And I was like, yeah, it just makes absolutely no sense to me, you know? Because I loved like sitting there and like, you know, trying to judge and everything else. Like, you know, I was like every other, like muscular development, Iron Man, Muscle Mag, all those magazines were at home. Right. You know, I would, I would look at them every time they came in because we got the magazines every month. So I would always look at the pictures and say like, oh, I don't know how this happened. Or I don't know how that happened, you know? So... No, I always, I always enjoyed it, and that's like that was my first like weekend where I said, okay, this is definitely something that I want to do. That's awesome. Do you, did you always have an affinity for Jay even before that, or is that what kind of drew you to him because you got to see him? No, I always liked like Jay ever since I met him when I was like really little, and he was, you know, Jay's the best with fans too. But you know, he was always super, super nice, super nice with me. 
I remember like he, he would even like you know follow with what I was doing with wrestling. And every now and then, like he'd call my dad or my grandpa and say, "Oh, let me ask Tyler how the wrestling would go." So I, that's why, like, I always really liked Jay. And that was back, like, when I was like real, you know, real young. Yeah, when you're, I remember, God, what year was it that you came to Stanford and I was there because it was like 30, 40 minutes away from where I lived. That was then, like, I mean, that was that was a good bit ago. That was probably almost ten years ago. Was it really that long? Yeah. Wow. Because yeah. you were, I think you were just like. Your first or second year? Second year in college, yeah. Second year in college. Yeah. And you're, and I, and you're, we, we and were out there off, for a tournament, yeah. A tournament, and you were coming off a shoulder injury. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So that was after my first year. Yeah. That was my second year. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people don't know that you were a college wrestler. I mean, I think you had a scholarship, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I went to the University of Maryland. I, you know, Vernon Davis is old stomping grounds. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wrestling, wrestling taught me a lot for sure. You know, it's a sport that basically you get humbled a lot. So, you know, you combine everything and you don't have the kind of career you want, but it, it teaches you a lot of responsibility and, you know, also that, you know, there's always someone out there that's bigger and badder than you. Did you ever consider competing? Competing? Yeah. Like Oh, in, like in, I, I would have loved to compete if my last name was a man and I wasn't <laughs> going to do this. Was, yeah. that, was that the biggest holdup in regards to that? Was if there was no issue with you having a different last name, would you have gotten on? Oh, on I, I, I would have loved to. Yeah. What division would you have done? I mean, back then there there was, you know, when I was little, there was bodybuilding and then like men's physique came out and then classic and everything. So like if I would have had my choice, if I was like 20 years old again, and all the divisions were here, I probably would have chose classic. Classic. Yeah. Just because you just didn't think you would end up being like big enough. In yeah, terms exactly. Of up there. Yeah, I, yeah. Think a lot, I think that's what classic really does. It gives you an out. Yeah. Right? You don't have to get to that freak factor. Yep of a Derek or a hottie or a Jay or a Phil. Yeah. You get to be able to stop at a certain point and say, hey, look, my genetics might not be able to carry that much weight. Exactly. So, and I think, honestly, it's it's been great because since you came on and Jim started really working on creating those other divisions, I remember the shows used to be like 70 people yeah. at the NPC level. And that was like a big show. It was 70 people. It was a big show. And then you'd be like, okay, normally 40, 50 people at a show because you had men's bodybuilding and you had women's bodybuilding. Yep. And then you turn around and go, okay, we had fitness, then you had figure, and then the figure used to have the one piece and the two piece rounds, and the women were spending all this money on the pieces, and then everyone and back in Pittsburgh is like, ah, oh, maybe we should just cut it down to two pieces so they didn't have to spend so much money on these really crazy bedazzled suits. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, let's turn around and let's give a wide division do you know where physique started? How was that started? Do you, do you have any backstory on that? Because as you kind of started growing up, yeah. I started seeing things. And I was just always wondering when you started putting in your influence in regards to the division. Because it's like, you know, wellness. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, your fiance is Brazilian, yes. right? Yeah. Like, you know, doing that division has grown tremendously. But where did, when you're coming up, where did you end up giving your two cents in? So I remember men's physique was brought up, and I'm pretty sure it was brought in in two th into the NPC in 2008 or 2009. So right around the time again, like that same time period where I was in, you know, just going into high school and everything like that. And you know, once I had expressed to my grandpa that you know I was interested in this and everything, then he would include me and ask me about things with decisions and everything else. And you know, I just remember, you know, there was, of course, a little bit of hesitation about it was men's and women's physique getting added, you know, new divisions. But I said, you know, it only makes sense for to include, you know, more of the population and what they can do, you know, to compete inside our organization. And, you know, he discussed it with a lot of people. Then that got added. And then, you know, I can't even remember what it was exactly, but that prompted classic physique. But then, you know, with classic you know, I, I helped with the heights and the weights originally and all this other stuff. Like he, you know, he brought me in to help, to help with everything. So once I was in high school, he started coming to me for more and more just to get my input, you know, it could have been my input. And he said, uh, whatever, like, you know, but I, he let me talk back and forth with him, even if he disagreed completely. So, but that's what was cool and helped me start learning, you know, so much. Yeah. Cause a lot of the old school and one thing about your grandfather that I know, cause I've known him for a very long time is that he's super loyal. Right. He's yes. loyal to those that are loyal to him. Yes. And I remember so many promoters used to say, I don't want this division. I don't want this division. It's like mankini, they used to call it. Yeah. Right. They're like, this mankini, it doesn't belong here. It doesn't make sense in bodybuilding. But the minute your grandfather said, nope, we're doing it. And then they saw the numbers come in. 
and then it just started blowing up and the shows were doubling and tripling once once these divisions were added it changed the whole entire organization for sure i mean you're just giving you're giving opportunity to you know way more people to get involved which is what which is what this you know industry and the organization and everything needed you know absolutely i mean i remember uh when Sadiq was going against jeremy and you know during his reign of the four olympia titles and yeah you saw so many an influx from the asian culture that said look i would never do open bodybuilding but i would do this yeah and then you turn around and go okay well anybody who didn't have a crazy you know amount of size or had the propensity to put on amount high amounts of muscle mass said i can actually still compete i just want to be brad pitt with abs yeah right and so what ended up happening was that next thing you know it became a great division because it was a feeder division. And then as people were building up, then they can go into classic and be like, okay, now I can, you know, I have legs so I can do that. Or I just want to stay in men's physique. Now, when you start to fast forward and you're looking at now with wellness, how do you, what do you think about wellness? Do you, is it something that you're personally a fan of? Yeah, of course. I mean, I definitely am. I, I, I put out a criteria video, right? Because I think like the top two girls right now in the world are great examples of wellness. And, you know, sometimes I think some people run wild with what we want to do with their criteria, especially on the woman's side. It's extremely important to try to, you know, enforce the criteria, but also let people know what the criteria is, which is why I started doing my videos to put out there for everybody as well. Because we want to tone it back for what a lot of girls are doing, you know, size wise and stuff like the top two girls. That's what wellness is and what wellness is supposed to be. So the rest of the top 10 from the year prior actually did downsize a little bit more. You could tell they're listening, but it's still going to take a little bit of time because it is the newest division mm -hmm. to try to really get that standard like across many more people than just the top two, you know? Yeah, and the hard thing is, and this is something that's been, I think, the most difficult, is the trickle-down effect because you'll say this is the criteria, but then you have to make sure that all the judges around the country are also going to fall in line. Yes. And then they don't go right back to bodybuilding criteria. And I, that's where I felt like there was so many issues early on because it would always go back. Those, those guys that were the same guys that, that were around for 30 years that said, I don't want men's physique. Now all of a sudden we're judging the guys to a point where some of them were too big. Yes. I mean, because muscle looks good on right. a physique, right? Muscle looks good. So it's just naturally when you're, you know, you're, it doesn't matter if you're a judge or just someone watching, you're like, oh, wow, this person looks great. And a lot of times like, hey, you can, you can look amazing, but you don't fit that division. Right. And getting everything like in line with the criteria is not easy, right? It's not easy. But to do that is so important to keep everything differentiated so you have those actual divisions. You know, that's why we did the put the height and weight on men's physique last year. Right. We started, you know, last year, like at the Olympia, you know, right after the Olympia. So I think... But the good thing was is the guys got the message right away and there was very few guys that at the Olympia where we weren't actually making you make weight, but there was very few guys that were over five pounds of what the weight limit was. Because the they one, were already dialed the in. One, yeah, the ones that, there was a lot, a lot that would have made weight completely if we started there, you know, and then like, I think like there was like 10 or 12 guys that missed it and like 80% of them were within five pounds, which, you know, you know, Five pounds is really not that much. If you're actually pushing to cut the weight, it's not it's not that hard Speaking to do. Speaking from a wrestling yeah. background. Yes, exactly. Right. So, but even like, you know, dialing in for that, they just, hey, instead of eating a meal or whatever in the morning, they they would have just cut that out. You know, a couple, it wouldn't have taken too much for them to No, get you to can the cut weight. back your fluid. Yeah. So, so like, it was good to see that, that that took a hold so fast. And obviously, the way we're judging, more aesthetically pleasing. We don't want the big, dense, you know, bodybuilder look, which... At the top, like if you just look at the top four guys, what they look like this year, and you actually go up next to them in person, right? Because seeing them in video or pictures, you're going to say, oh, they're muscular, this. Yeah, of course they have muscle, but when you see them next, like in person, you're like, oh, man, this guy's not massive at all. Like no. really, like Ryan and Brandon, they're not they're not that big. Once you stand next to them, they're in a T-shirt and you're in a T-shirt, and you're like, oh. But you can like, just tell they work out. Yeah, yeah. They don't look so overpowering and massive. So, yeah, it's. I think it's, it's going to be a really, really good thing for the direction of the sport, too. No, I, I agree, and especially someone like like uh, you mentioned Ryan. I've been a huge fan of his for a very long time, and I think that part of it is he figured out his peak. Yes. But I also think that also there was an apex of of this look 
that you guys were going for and him peaking where this year was just like, wow, this yeah, it is was, awesome. It was crazy. Yeah. I mean, he improved so much to his back and his posing. Everything came together for him at the perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great because he's also such a good dude. I yeah. Mean, great representative know, for the sport. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the um, going through the different divisions with classic, did you also have to kind of make those those weight changes because you were also doing the men's physique changes? Was that also kind of in com combination because you wanted to make sure everything was balanced out in the entirety of bodybuilding? Yes. Yeah, for sure. And also really when like... I, you know, I can't even remember because it was so long ago, but we had, there was someone else that helped us with the weights of classic and everything like that. But I hadn't looked at the classic weights in a long time mm -hmm. and like how the weights were jumping didn't make total sense. Once I went back and looked at it when I was looking at the men's physique weights. Uh -huh. So that's why we had to do a little bit of tinkering with that as well, just to try to make, you know, an evil, like an even and level playing field for everybody. And then that way we got did the men's physique, it, once we set, once we got classic, right, then we were like, okay, men's physique is going to be X amount of pounds less than that. That's going to be the difference. And, you know, 10 pounds of muscle is, is a lot of weight. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who, who did it earlier too, because I didn't have anybody obviously in the, in the uh, division at the time. But then when I went back after only, <laughs> to be honest with you, only after you guys changed the weights yeah. that I would go back and like research what happened when you guys were setting up the weights, um, uh, before the uh, this last year's adjustment because you got a call from me. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, why does everybody else get an eight pound jump and Chris gets two pounds? Yes. You know, and I was like, what's going on? And you're like, dude, go back and look, you know, go back and look at the jumps that they had. It kind of doesn't make sense. <laughs> exactly. And I go yeah. back and I look, I go, ah, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> can we get four pounds? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, can we add a little bit of weight on there? And they're like, go look at the pictures right now <laughs> and you'll see yeah. kind of where it's at. And then I go, yeah, you know, I, I, I get it and I understood. And I think that what makes me a fan of classic physique now more than ever is because it, it creates the guardrails that you don't have in the other divisions that don't have weight. When you have weight now, especially with um, also with now with men's physique, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, and this is why I think classic was become so popular is because now you're saying, look, this is the look you're going to achieve. And the way we're going to keep you looking like this is because we're going to we're going to grade you and bigger isn't always better. Exactly. Yeah. Where with open, it, you know, you had the freak factors of the Dorian Yates yes. and the Ronnie Coleman's and you had all of those different eras. And then you had the Nassers and the, and the, you know, Marcus rules and everybody's just like, okay, I'm just going to get well, crazy. When, when you're competitive, what do you want to do? You want to keep pushing. You want to keep pushing. You want to keep gaining. So all these guys that are in classic, if there wasn't a weight cap, what do you think that they would be doing? They'd be doing the same thing. They're going to try to get bigger and bigger and they're not going to care about how right. big they get and what their weight is they're, they're just going to try to find that advantage in doing that now it makes it even like you have to really sculpt your body in classic right. you can your weight comes to a point where you can still look bigger give the illusion of being bigger but weight wise you're, you're not going to be able to go over that certain threshold and that's i think that's what's kept the physique so pleasing too in that in that division but obviously chris has a lot of muscle density and is very muscular so is everybody else in the rest of the top five as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, Breon, Breon has been, you know, at his weight cap since he probably won, you know, probably what was that, six years ago right. when he was winning. And he looks way better now, and he's way older too. He, Breon's the oldest one. Yes. He, he's way better now than he How was six years ago. Like I don't know his exact age, but I'm pretty sure he's at least in the mid 40s. He's okay. older than everybody thinks. I don't know if he, want, if he wants that out there, but <laughs> super, super, super impressive with what he's doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that also when you're talking about all of these guys and the evolution of the division, what you're saying is bigger isn't better because number one, you can't get any bigger because of, of, of the weight. But even now, everybody was asking me, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about it? And again, at first I was just like, holy shit, what's going to happen? Yeah. Right. Are they going to all start looking much more open ask because of the amount of weight? But you saw Ramon still looked really, really good, very conditioned. He was very you know, like hard as nails, much, much improved with being able to put more size. But if he continues to try to put on too much size, then it could actually end up hurting him. Yes. Right. Yeah. And you'll, you'll end up growing out of the division, which some guys have done. You know, some guys have done so, but that, again, that's the next step, that next evolution. If they're going to grow out, then they're going to grow into the open. But I also think why Classic was is so great to while we started it is 
you see what these guys' waistlines are now mm -hmm. in the open class. And obviously there was an emphasis placed not only in classic, but also in the open about controlling the waistline and everything else. But we've seen it now where the top three in the Mr. Olympia can all pull vacuums. Yeah. I don't know when the last time what there was when guys could do that a long, long time ago, right? Probably in the early 80s, maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, that just goes to show you the emphasis on it has went all the way up. And like, even with the bigger guys, they're working on building not only big, but also very, very pleasing physiques while being dense and muscular and everything else. Yeah. And I think that what's going to happen, which is really cool, is that you're going to have fans of both. And it's not a matter of just saying, okay, I'm just a, a classic fan or I'm just an open fan. But you can sit there and sit down and say, okay, I'm a fan of this division, a fan of that division. Because, and that's what I'm seeing with wellness, because wellness is the only asymmetrical division. Yes. Okay. And when, for those of you that are listening to those podcasts or watching it on YouTube, well, what I mean by asymmetrical, it means that everything else is balanced between your upper body and your lower body. But in wellness, you want a smaller upper body and you want a fuller lower body. And uh, you're doing a good job, you know, you guys, you, Sandy, and everybody explaining it in the seminar today and the seminars that you guys have been putting all around the country. But when it comes to that, was that something that was started in Brazil that yes. kind of caught your attention? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we, you know, once we had shows down there, I went down there for the first time in 2018 and Tamer and Tarek were like, let us run this division. It's not for like at the pro qualifier. It's not for a pro car or anything. We just want you to see it. Mm -hmm. It is crazy big in Brazil. And I was like, yeah, sure. I guess we'll, we'll see. You know, they're like, no, we're telling you it's like bigger than bikini. So I was like, well, I guess I'll see. And then once it, once I came out I, and I saw it, it was very, it was very impressive too. So I was like, oh, we have we have to have this. I mean, there's a lot of women out there that are more, you know, bottom heavy, right, right. than muscular up top. Just genetically. Yeah, genetically. Right. So that's like how women in Brazil are built genetically. They're they're lower body dominant. So anybody that's played sports or anything else all over the world, not just in the U.S. but in Europe, anywhere, I was like, there's definitely like you know a home for this to add it in, you know, and again. It gives more opportunity to more people to build their platform and everything else. So it ended up after all I needed to see was that one time. And then, you know, we did it again. And then we were like, okay, let's, let's start this everywhere and build it up. And it's, it's done great since we did add it. Do you think that you're going to add any more women's divisions right now in the foreseeable future? In the foreseeable future? I don't, I'm don't foresee, you know, unless something comes up that, you know, is crazy or whatever. I don't see us adding a division either on the men or the women right now. Okay. Yeah. And that was the other second question I was, was going to ask was because I had, to, I wrote a letter. I don't know if you remember about four years ago Yeah. regarding the weight classes, putting weight classes in, or possibly adding another division to the men that would be back to kind of like that Jeremy esque kind of like, like the, the original, like 2010, 11 look. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like the, the Brad Pitt with abs look that was like, I called it beach body or something. Yeah. Right. And I think that, uh, there's, just to, to kind of like say, hey, this is another possible thing. Is that something, have you guys had a chance to, to think about that possibly? Has it ever been something where starting out on a lower level where you set a bar a bit lower for those that might want to get back in to or, or think about getting into? Yeah, is, so that, that it's, all, it's always like a challenge to see, like we're always going to review everything, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, nothing's off the table. But it's also like when someone starts out, you're just starting out. So, and in every division, what do you want to do? Like, okay, we would have to find a set of rules, right, that would keep something in line that's lower than already what men's physique is. And that's not easy either when it comes to the conditioning and everything else. Like, it, it will take, you know, it would take a good bit of time. But also, like, for the Olympia, to become an Olympia champion, you're the best in the world right. at what you do, right? So if I'm looking at that, it doesn't matter which division, say, okay, I want to do this. Well, if I was swimming or if I was running track and field or fighting or whatever else, I'm not going to look at the best in the world and say, I expect to do this in one year. I expect to do this in two years. Right. It's, it's going to be a process if that really is your goal. So they should look impressive, you know, but there's definitely like, you know, especially on the woman's side, there is a clear difference from the bikini Olympia to any division above it. Right. You know, once you see them in person too, even though they look full and have, you know, like good muscle, but they're full and very feminine. Then you see him in person, and realize, oh, she's 
she's not as big as I thought. She looked in the pictures or the videos I see on Instagram or anything else. Right. Oh, wow, I, I, I thought she was so much bigger. I'm just starting, you know, I know I have to put on muscle, but it's like, that doesn't look unattainable. But it should look impressive because they're the best in the world. That's my opinion on it, at least. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it that way, I, I think that's a great way to explain it because a lot has to be put into, is that person elite enough to look like a world champion? Yes. Right. And you're not just saying, hey, this is just a world champion app contest. Yeah. It's going to have to be an overall physique contest. But yeah, I think that at some point, I know you guys continue to evaluate things. If it ever gets to that point, because people ask me all the time. And I said, I think personally that eventually there's going to be another division, another kind of below it because it could be differentiated enough down the road. Yeah. But right now we're not there yet. But eventually, do I think that it's going to happen? I think so. It's just hard to say when. Yeah. Right. It was like with the weight classes. I you had a really good idea that there was going to be weight classes. It's just you didn't know when. Yeah. For men's physique. Also, when you threw in the men's physique portion in, you threw in something else about the legs. Yes. Right. So let's touch on that for a second too, because I really think that that was really cool. Because there is something that says you can't look like you're walking on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes. Because it's just going to look really, really strange. Um, what was the thought process in that? Was it mostly just making sure to kind of complete the look or? I mean, again, we're talking about competitors, so you're always going to try to find an edge in whatever, whatever's put out there. So immediately, okay, we're going to put weights on. Okay. I won't train my legs. I'm just going to train upper body because the guys want to get bigger. That's just what it is, right? They want to get bigger. I'll just train my upper body and get bigger. No, man, that's going to look horrible. You know? So it's like, we had to make sure, Hey, the shorts are going to have to be a couple inches above the knee. They should be tapered, and we're going to look. We're not judging your quads the same way we judge the quads in classic or in or in open, but we need to see some leg development under there because you shouldn't be having loose board sort shorts or baggy board shorts and some you know crazy upper body, which a bit too big of an upper body is going to be judged on anyway. But now, if you have no balance at all, then we're going to you know that's going to hurt you a little bit as well too. What about calves? I mean, calves. Calves are obviously very, very genetic. I mean, look at look at Dexter, for example. Mm -hmm. Dexter trained calves all the time. He, he had, you know, n not very good calves. <laughs> He's Mr. Olympia, right? Right, right. So you, you got to at least look like you're doing something. Like, of course, if it's all bone down there, then it's like, now it is going to throw off the look of your physique too. So right. you have to have at least something down there. But it's like, if you have big calves or whatever, or you're, you know, your calves aren't genetically good, it's not going to hurt you either way. You just need to look like you're doing some type of training, which you can tell if someone's training their calves, whether they have good calf genetics or bad calf genetics, you know? So on your assessment right now, was there anybody at this year's Olympia? Have you guys started kicking in that uh, board shorts? Was that at the Olympia? Uh, so that was at the in show. Terms of fullness. That was the week after the Olympia. The week after the Olympia. Yes. So since then, have you had a chance to judge? Yes. Okay. And on those different competitions, has it come to the conclusion, like, where you had to pick one over another so far because of the lack of fullness in the thighs? Was that, was it ever close enough yet where you had to go to that kind of, you know, like, okay, these guys are really close, but this guy has a very thin, thin quads. Oh yeah. Yeah. I and mean, have even, you had to really do that? even like at nationals, right in the NPC, yeah. cause it's all the way down. It's NPC all the way to the pros. Yeah. Even like at nationals, you could see like some guys are super, super close, right? Oh, well, Hey, this guy doesn't like really doesn't train his legs. You can see that's part of the criteria now. So, that could be a differentiating factor, yeah. I mean, I think a, like a decent amount of men's physique pros have have pretty solid legs, but there's some that are even good good pros too that really that didn't have much. And when they come back this year, it could be for you know a chance to go to the Olympia. They don't have the leg development, and it looks so unbalanced where it's catching your eye, right? And it's like a super close thing. That could be the thing that takes them out from going to the Olympia this year. I mean, it it's destined to happen. There's no doubt, you know probably multiple times this year. So I know because the, even at like the seminars, uh, don't worry, I'm working my legs. Okay. I'll, I'm glad you got the message because that would suck to see someone have to, you know, they're losing men's physique because they just decided they didn't want to train legs. Right. And then on the flip side of that, as a trainer, I would say, Hey, by the way, don't go too crazy on your legs. If you still are needing to fill up your upper body. Exactly. Because then if you're hitting your weight class, because you've got, you know, your quadzilla with board shorts on, you're not doing yourself any favors there either. Exactly. So again, it's bringing more balance to that division like there is with basically every other division. Awesome. And then when you are looking at this division in its entirety, do you feel, I mean, again, I know that you said, hey, I personally like the classic, but w it, you know, there's a reason why there's $400,000 are going to the Mr. Olympia, right? The Sandow yeah. goes to the Mr. Olympia competition. 
I get a lot of questions about when prize money is being handed out about the men's physique versus the classic being the same. I think the last I checked, they were both $50,000 Yes. about that. Has there been anything in that arena? Because the, the, the people that are chiming in are talking about, well, you're showing a lot more physique in classic physique and you're posing versus doing a front and a rear. And how does that balance out in regards to the dollars? Do you know anything? I mean, what's your opinion on that? So right now, other than the Mr. Olympia, every division is paid the same at the Olympia. Okay. Okay. But um, we've seen, we have other shows all throughout the year, right? That give away from the minimum prize money to added prize money all throughout. And I would probably say like the division that has the most like shows that, that have above the minimum prize money is probably classic, right? Because again, the entertaining factor, they're doing more poses, everything like that. So... I mean, our goal is always to try to, you know, do things as equally as possible, obviously. But when opportunities present themselves, uh, you know, when we go and talk about the corporate sponsorships, if someone really wants to do something, right, for classic physique, then, you know, like we just did for the men, whichever divisions we're, we're going to get right now, we're going to make the change to. Well, a lot of you don't know that it just got announced this last week that there is a corporate sponsor. Is there one or two? It's so... It's two companies that, you know, they uh, came together. It's uh, Uprising, powered by MIT-45. Okay. They're the corporate sponsor for the Open Men. I haven't heard of them. What do they do? Uh, they're in, like, botanical supplement, you know, industry. Okay. And they came over and said, we want to be able to do a corporate sponsorship. And I believe it was for the Open class. Yes. Okay. And then the total amount was 210000 so 210,000 will be going to the open men. It's going to be split up evenly 10,000 for 21 open shows. So this is the first time that there's been an increase in since I can remember. Yes. In open shows. Open shows always had a minimum first class uh, first place of $10,000, so there's many $10,000 yes. shows and that's been going on for like over 25 years. And now for the first time they're going from 10 grand to all of them are going to 20,000. Is that is that so? Accurate? No, it's going to go from first place is going to go from ten to fifteen. Ten to fifteen, and second's going to go from four to nine. Got it. So that's the extra money that's yes. been going. In. Got it. I wasn't clear because I heard that there was money coming back in, but I didn't realize uh, at what degree. So, and that's happening for the entirety of this whole season for the calendar year of twenty twenty four. Yes, that's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. So, you know, I'm super. I'm super excited about it. I'm hoping it's the first of many. Right. Um, everything that we've been working on, you know, as organizationally for the last, I'd say, four years has led to us being able to pull everything together, all the data, everything that we have and leverage everything to go after these bigger type of sponsorships. And then, you know, obviously, I think the next level for us to help grow everything is by increasing the prize money, you know, for these athletes. Sure. Obviously, the, the pro league itself, you know, we are a platform for everybody you know, to do basically what you want with the platform, like through competing. Some people do it, you know, for the love of competing and that's it. They have their businesses and, you know, outside of this and everything else. But there are a lot of people that have, you know, whether it's a side business or they've made their their actual main businesses, you know, inside this industry, which really it's it's all, you know, it's all up to you, but there is a lot of money inside this industry to be made if you, you know, apply yourself and you're using this platform of competing to go to go do whatever you want to do. I mean, there's pros that don't place well at all that have smash it. Great, great careers, you know, inside this industry because of what they did from when they were competing or they're still competing or whatever else, whether it's coaching, you know, a soup business, a tanning business, a supplement business, whatever it is, you know. So that's, you know, we're a platform, but the more we can build up the prize money, mm -hmm. the better it's going to be and then of course like, you know, I want to get these corporate sponsorships that right now they have some type of connection to the industry. That's the first thing I'm, I'm working on. Okay. You connect to the industry. You could, you know, the value, you can see what's going on when we, when we present this presentation to them and everything else. And then the goal is once you capture so many of those is to start building and building where, you know, I can go outside of this industry and try to bring in businesses that never would have thought to, you know, be involved in bodybuilding and fitness, but there's such a great market here. And I feel like, the consumers in our industry are more loyal than your average whatever industry it is. 
So once you bring these companies in here and mainstream, you know, mainstream companies equals more mainstream attention. What does that equal? A way, way bigger platform mm -hmm. for the athletes and for business owners and for everybody else in this industry to start succeeding and growing even more. So that's that's the goal, you know, on my end. That's that's the long term vision for sure. So I'm excited we got off to a good start. Shout out Uprising again, powered by Mid45. They that's were awesome. they were the first ones to do this, which hopefully is the first domino to fall and in, in some big big news. Yeah, that's that would be great. I mean, we were talking about it earlier and. If there's anybody out here listening that wants to get involved, you know, reach out to Tyler on Instagram and, or I'm sure you're, you're, you're or the, email. you know, the email, the pro league email, anything. Yeah. Okay. And I guess I would love to see, I mean, there's one reason why I signed Sid Gillian it was because I have a personal, uh, just, just love for figure, right? Yes. I got to work with Jenny Lynn. I got to work with Nicole Wilkins, um, and be a part of uh, their journey in figure. And then I saw that she wasn't sponsored. And I was just kind of blown away. And then I was just like, okay, no big deal. Um, let's kind of like, kind of like, okay, what's going on here? And what really triggered me into actually speaking to her about it, and we, it just kind of was um, kind of destiny, was that at the Arnold a couple of years ago, I had heard right before that she was buying products from Evigen. And then I'm like, wait, wait a minute. And I, I ran into her and I said, hey, congratulations for winning Arnold. She's like, oh, thanks to you for, for the supplements. You know, I purchase your products and I love them. And I go, well, who's your sponsor? Why are you buying my products? It's like, well, I've been using your products for years. And I was like, okay, we need to have a conversation. And then we talked into two weeks later, we ended up talking and we ended up signing her and she's been with us ever since. But it's one of those things where I just feel like a lot of the women do not get the love that they should in this industry on sponsorship level. And so if we can get some more of those corporate dollars and get that rolling in there, I think that, you know, they trickle down those, those corporate dollars start trickling down into the other divisions as well on yes. the women's side would be great. I really still feel that there should be, um, some people are cutting out, uh, divisions, uh, women's divisions. And I feel like that should be reconsidered coming in. But I guess my other th question for you regarding that is that, do you feel that maybe we're limited because there needs to be some more posing or do you feel like that would help some of the divisions like figure? Uh, or has there been any thought into that to try to maybe kind of reinvigorate it where changing up a little bit of that, maybe adding in some proposing criteria might help as well just to give it a little bit like a, a refresh or attention possibly? So I don't know if it's exactly about the amount of posing they do uh -huh. or anything else because, I, you know, for example, so for figure, why is why do you think like excitement could be added? Well, we know why. Sydney's won for, I think, seven straight years, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the same thing right. when Phil was winning. Right. Oh, it's a foregone conclusion, right? When right. Ronnie was winning, oh, the same thing, even right. though Ronnie had Jay. Yeah. So Ronnie had, a, you know, another all-time legend pushing it, but still people are like, oh, it's, you know, so many people probably, it's just Ronnie. That's, you know, that's it. It's automatic. That's why they That's why they started the challenge round. That's why they were all trying the, to, yeah. to try to re-bolster and, and do all these Exactly, yeah. So right. when you have a dominant champion in whichever division, you lose some of that excitement because – now everybody's going into the year thinking like it's impossible to, you know, dethrone this person or whatever else. And, you know, time's undefeated. So everybody's time ends up coming to an end. And then, of course, when that does happen with a dominant champion, it's all, you know, crazy. Now, when Phil lost, we've had no dominant champion since then. Right. You know, and I think even now, these guys at the top, I mean, you saw the top three at the Olympia. Yep. All they're doing is going back and getting better. Nick didn't even compete at the Olympia. He's going to be right in there. Right. You got a guy like Andrew that he's finally taken an off season. He he grew and improved while he competed for like two years straight. Right. You have no idea what's going to happen. So like the Open is extremely exciting because you know right now there is no dominant person. So that's why I feel like this is like really really exciting area for the Open. But yeah, I mean even in classic until this past year when Ramon improved, the last, the couple years before that it was like yeah. Like who's who's really going to be able to challenge Chris because no one no one was close objectively no one was even coming close to him now all of a sudden Ramon took a big step and this probably has to be the most anticipated classic Olympia sure ever you know because there's now an all time champion and a guy that's chasing him that looks really really good yeah and then you got you know three four more guys right behind that that are like extremely high level too so it's that's you know I think that that leads to the ebb and flow of excitement for whatever division. 
Right, right. I guess my whole thing was just that does anything ever come into mind or you guys in Pittsburgh when you guys are having these conversations of saying, hey, like, should we throw in a pose just in just, you know, again, just so that it, it get it to evolve possibly. Is that something that has been talked about for a men's? Because I, I see these men's physique guys, right? And they're hitting back double biceps. They're doing like these twists. And you know they all want to pose, yeah. right? I mean, Jeremy used to do it, right? Yeah. Like he'd just come in and do it. And so I just laugh because now you're seeing more and more of it. And you got to tell them, dude, chill out. Yeah. Especially when you have 100 guys yes. in a division so because it takes up a lot of time. But it, when you're looking at it, do you have you guys had that conversation about some of the divisions? So we, ha we have. But again, once you start posing, what is that? When, then what are you looking at when you're, when you're watching a pose? You're looking at muscularity. Mm -hmm. You're looking at hardness. You're looking like it becomes about making it more and more impressive, which again leads to muscularity and size changes. So, like to keep the to keep the divisions under control. Uh -huh. Some divisions definitely can't be you know be posing. If you let the men's physique guys pose, then yeah. they're gonna tr they're just gonna try to get bigger and bigger. You know, it's right. gonna be crazy. For sure. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Like imagine if, imagine if we didn't have the weight caps on and the new, and like the rule about you have to have you know some leg development. That these guys would never train legs, right? And right. they would try to be as massive as Derek, you know, and yeah. Samson in their upper body. Right. That so that's why like some posing just doesn't work for some of the things, you know, just making them start to pose or add in more poses. Yeah, under understandable. Yeah, I guess in figure it's always about the silhouette. Right? Yes, it's all about the silhouette. And um, when you get into these different divisions, I, I just like you said, it's now you do have an ebb and flow. You have certain divisions. When you turn around and you go, okay, well, like Adela, when she was winning everything in, in fitness, and she was like, boom, boom, boom. Now you have, again, it's really going back and forth in the open. Yes. And with that, you had Hottie and Derek, again, very close both years. Yes. And they flip-flopped this year. I guess, was that something that that decision was made this last year on Saturday night? Or was it kind of clear cut on Friday to you guys? Or I guess was there? It would just be good to get an idea from the judging panel uh, how your thought process was going on. I mean, do you guys go back after the uh, pre judging and then go, okay, this is what I think, this is what's going on, and then you know, kind of like have have these conversations? Yeah, I mean, so they were very very close on Friday, right? It it the show was up for grabs when it comes from Friday to Saturday because. Mm -hmm. The judges are split, so when the judge, you know, it, me and Steve could be sitting right next to each other and not agree on, you know, that the, you know, what the placings are going to be. That's also why there's, you know, eleven, like there's eleven scoring judges at the Olympia. Right. So, you know, me, Steve, and Sandy are right there, and you know, when a show is super close, I mean, even especially in the men now, it could be we have three different winners, and we could talk. To, we're going to talk through it, obviously, and say I'm seeing this. Okay, front double bicep. I think uh, uh, Derek wins this pose. Okay, why I say. He's saying, okay, I think Hottie wins this pose. Okay, why? He's going to say. And we can go back and forth through the whole thing, and then at the end just be like, okay, I, just, I don't agree with you. You know, we're going to put we're gonna put whatever we think. So if one one or the other, right, would have slipped up completely on Saturday, then that's it. it it's over. But it's it's been so close the last two years that it came down to Saturday night. And, like, the year prior, mm -hmm. I thought, I was like, wow, I think Derek really looked good on Friday. And then... I didn't think Hottie looked his best, but I still thought he looked great. Yep. Then Saturday comes, Hottie looks way better, mm -hmm. and Derek, to me, looked like a good bit flatter than he was, and like especially those side poses where in 2022, I thought the side poses were very close between the two. Mm -hmm. But on Saturday night, Hottie's like hardness and conditioning and everything, and then Derek being flatter, I was like, oh, this is, this is Hottie's, you know, this is Hottie's night. That's it. it the score was, I think one or two points again after Friday for 2022 as well. So when it's like that, you're coming out and on Saturday, it's, it's going to determine the winner. So you got to, that's why you got to nail it both nights. Yeah. And then if you really like, again, some people, they really nail it. You could be ahead and you can afford to maybe slip just a tiny bit, even if the other person gets better. So to really nail it both nights is key. It's very difficult to do yeah. too. I remember with Phil, we'd always try to, Save a little in the tank. Yes. <laughs> so I don't remember who coined him, you know, Mr. Saturday Night, because we'd always try to just tweak it enough to be able to really crush. Come back and shut back the door. And yes. shut the door. Just be good enough, really good, and just be right in there. And, um, I mean, there was a couple of years where the first, uh, I think it was 2013, where Steve was like, it was like one set of 
uh, comparisons and then they put them back in line. Yes. Because it was so clear cut in 2013. But I think that the thing that I enjoy that's the ev evolution of what you guys are doing is that in the past, you weren't able to have a really clear, concise opinion from the judge's point of view. Yes. And I think you just even talking about right now how you guys kind of get into it a little bit. Has it gotten really like to the point where you guys like, you know, I mean, not just at the Olympia. I'm just talking about like in general, has there been shows where you guys are just like, like after pre I don't agree with you at all. Like what's oh, going oh, on? Oh, yeah. There's some times where you can get a little bit upset with the other <laughs> person. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, it's bound to happen, especially when you're, you're judging this. And the whole point of being a judge is you're sitting there and you, you want to get it right, right for the athletes. You know, like that's, that's what you're doing. So it's not just because like if me and Sandy are not agreeing, right. Or right. me and Steve are not agreeing. We're both referencing the criteria that we know what the criteria is, and we're not agreeing because we're thinking, like, if we're, re we're really disagreeing, I think that's wrong. Like, this is what the criteria is supposed to be. So, it, you know, we get a little bit heated with each other, but that's <laughs> that's what, you know, it's because everybody, especially, like, our top judges, we care so much about getting it right. Like, there's sometimes, like, I'll sit there, like, after the show's over, it'll be the next day, and, you know, I saw everything in person, and maybe, maybe I was the head judge, and... Uh, three of the judges decided like it for like in the top five, oh, they put this guy third and I had him in fourth and I thought it was like really clear, but I'm like, Oh my God, I think we messed up. Like, I think the other guy should have been in third. We're talking about third and fourth. at just like a normal show. Right. But like, you want to make sure you get everything right. So that's like, you, you know, we're talking we talk through it. And that's the biggest thing I think too, that now, like I want to make sure that our head judges, if someone comes up to him, I'm going to tell you what, what I saw. And I need to be able to talk through that. So whenever I talk to a judge that's at this show or there, we have five shows on a weekend and like I get on a call during the week, because when you're looking at pictures, you're looking at video, it's not telling the full story. It's way different being from me to you, from yes. the athletes. I'm watching every single muscle fiber on every competitor in every division move once they're moving around, right? right. You don't get that capture from a, a moment in time from a picture and you don't even get it from video. It doesn't matter how clear the video is. It's not the same as being, you know, 10 feet from them, sitting right in front the only thing that you were looking at is them. But as a head judge, you got to be able to explain exactly what you saw. Right. You know, hey, I'm going to talk to coaches and athletes that are upset. They don't agree at all, blah, blah, blah. But I'm still going to tell you exactly what I saw. It's okay if you disagree with me because, again, this is a subjective sport. But I want to make sure everybody's able to say exactly what they saw and talk through it. That's also another reason why I'm a big UFC fan, right? Mm -hmm. Boxing fan, fighting fan. Those guys – there's judges there, and you never will ever hear anything from the judges to describe what they saw and how they scored a fight. You never will. It's very true. I actually never thought of that. Yeah, you never will. You, they never sit down and break down like what it is. They don't have to go there. and In gymnastics or in diving at the Olympics, when they're scoring stuff like that, do you ever hear from the judges to do anything? No. No, you just have to think about, you, you know, you're seeing what, with what you know, but it's not informing the crowd. It's not informing the athletes. It's not informing the coaches. So... What I thought was, like, why at shows, you know, I'm giving feedback at all the shows I'm at anyway, right? So if I put this out there to explain things, now, again, you're a fan of someone, you're whatever, you're, uh, that's wrong, this is that, or I was at the show and you have a strong opinion, that's fine. I'm just going to tell you from my viewpoint at the judges' table what I saw, but I'm putting it out there not only to let coaches and let athletes know, but hopefully draw in more fans that a lot of fans are just a fan of one person or one athlete. Mm -hmm. So automatically they think they're the ones that are going to write, you got screwed, this, that, whatever. But to try to explain to them so they can at least hear something, there's an outlet for them to hear, and then all of a sudden they can become a fan of the sport as a whole. And again, I feel like that's how we grow the organization. That's how we grow the industry and start bringing in more fans so they – you know, even some of my friends, like back in the day, I don't even like, oh, this guy looks amazing or this girl looks amazing. Well, how are you differentiating it, right? Right. I think like that. that's, oh, that, they're the best looking. Well, why? I just think that, you know? Well, yeah. how do the judges know? But they don't know because no one would ever, you know, no one would ever explain it for them publicly. So that's why I wanted to do it. And I feel like it's brought, you know, at least more knowledge to the audience and everybody else. And then, of course, competitors love it and the coaches love it because they're going to use what I'm saying about certain people to craft what they're doing with their athletes or themselves to make sure they're fitting the standard and the criteria. Well, it's the first time I've noticed anybody putting themselves out there. So kudos to you for taking it. And I, again, not everyone's going to sit there and agree with you. Yes. But at least you're going to break it down on video 
because even today it's tough because it, with pictures yeah. and videos also tough because it's not in person. And one thing that I have to explain to everybody is that the transitions also count. Oh yeah. You know, and people go, Oh, because they just see that photo, right? Back in the day when we had magazines, all you'd see is you'd see the mandatory comparisons and it would come out three months later and it didn't really matter. It was just, here you go, three months later, and this is the list of the winners of the Olympia, yes. and then the top 10 and top 15 who placed. See them like in one pose individually, and that's it. And that's it. Now you have this a million photos all over the internet. It's much, much tougher now. Everyone's scrutinized. But not only are the athletes more scrutinized, now the judges are even more scrutinized. Yes. Because everybody wants to pick one kind of angle to be able to justify their thought. Yes. Right. And that makes things even tougher because now you're not going from 11 judges. You got a million judges. Yes. And everybody wants to circle body parts or wants to turn around and take a portion of time and be able to encapsulate that to justify their argument. Exactly. Yeah. And it sucks because I tell people this all the time. You weren't there. You have no idea. And so what makes it really hard. But when you're doing those breakdowns and putting yourself out there, kudos to you because a lot, nobody would do that before. Even... Um, it, it was just very cut and dry. Here you go. This is what it is. But I think it's also probably because it's a generational thing for you because now you're just like ha having to want to be a little bit more transparent yes. and say, hey, look, you may not want to agree with me, but I'm going to walk you through it. These are the poses that Derek won or this is the poses that Hottie won or this is the poses that Samson won, whoever it was that you're trying to break down and say, here you go. And I feel that going through and doing that in every single division is super important because of what you said. The Trainers need something to go off of. And in the past, they would try to email Sandy or whoever it was and get those 1,000 emails after the nationals. Yes. And then you're trying to sit there and, you know, and again, now you have one person kind of saying, okay, here you go. I'm going to break this down for you. So if you haven't watched those videos, please, guys, we'll go ahead and we'll put a link to the the NPC news so you can go see them because it really makes a difference, especially if you're a trainer and you're training athletes and you want to know what those criteria are because I get a lot of questions about why a certain person in men's physique got didn't place in the top five or top 10. And then I look at their arms and it's like, okay, the arms and the shoulders match up. They're too big because they match up. They should have a smaller arms to match their yep. delt and they can't you know have that. But if you go and look at these things, it makes a huge difference. But it's been never this transparent. So that's, that, that's been really cool. And again, putting yourself out there, you're also going to get m more people that's going to throw hate. Oh, of course. And yes. All of that. Does that ever get to you? I try not to look like, I try not to look at the comments. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I'll see something and it'll get me all fired up and I'll be like, why, why did I even like look at my, that? My, my fellow Iranians out there and the Brazilians, <laughs> they're the most, they're, they're the, which one did you say was number one jam? Was it number one? Was the Brazilians the hottest head or the Iranians? We we get the number one award. We get the number one, and then the number two is the Brazilians. There you go. So JM said, uh, yeah, they, they get they get the maddest for sure. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, obviously they would have to get the video translated so they're going to understand because there's a language barrier. But I heard uh, I heard you're working on Farsi. Uh, and yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, Etzel is mad that I don't know Portuguese yet. But I mean, <laughs> you know, it's but also like to do that, it's to try to educate all these fan bases, international fan bases that we have now with the growth of the sport. So. To try to educate them more, like I saw a lot of the Brazilians were saying, like, um, ab and thigh, and they only cared about the abs for the ab and thigh pose. It's like, no, we're looking from your wrist all the way down to your toes. Right. So we're taking into account the whole body in every single pose. But I know so many Brazilians were commenting and saying, like, okay, front double biceps, and they care about the biceps. Okay, but we're looking at your whole entire arm plus everything else and how it's flowing into your physique and the taper and the separation and every, everything like that. It's taken into account on every pose, but I feel like we're starting to educate, obviously, since I speak English more, the, you know, English speaking audience, but to try to get to the audiences that don't speak English so they can, you know, understand more of, of what we're looking for. And again, sometimes it doesn't matter. You just have the person you're rooting for and that's it. That if they don't win, then, you know, you're it, a, they're it mad. Was, yeah, they're mad. It was a robbery, whatever right. else. But I mean, again, like it's the same thing with the, you know, the UFC, every decision is your guy loses. Oh, that was, you know, that was a robbery. And that's kind of like what made me do it too. Cause I was like, Oh, as a fan, like that's so frustrating. Like they, they just put out their cards and there's no explanation. It's like, you know, you, you feel like, you know what you're looking at, 
like, I don't understand or I don't get that at all. So at least, hey, I'm, I'm going to go out there. I'll give them my opinion. And again, the Olympia, there was judges that voted Derek first and there's judges that voted Hottie first. Right. So my opinion on that is not, you know, is not the same as someone else's too that was that was on that panel. They might have given another pose or two to the other person. Sure. It's the same thing like I'm reviewing, you know, another division where I might have had the person that took fourth and third. Now I'm going to give give the review on how the placings actually were and what people could have saw to see that placing. But, but that I, doesn't mean your actual... That doesn't mean my actual thing. Like, in, in my mind, I might have gave the deciding post to the other person, you know, but I can't make the videos too long where I'm going to give every dissenting opinion to each one. So I'm right. just going to try to explain, this is this is what was seen to to make the person place, you know, where, where they did. Where he or she did. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. You, you touched on something that I want to talk about, which is the international growth of the NPC worldwide. Um, ever since the NPC went worldwide, uh, the last several years, uh, gigantic explosion all over. Yes. Right. Um, I think the biggest so far I've seen is a uh, tamer muscle contest uh, in Brazil. Yes. It, absolutely killing it, tamer. So shout out to tamer out there and uh, the muscle contest people. But how how is that going right now? Because it's such, I mean, isn't it, is it like a double the size now because of that or triple the size? Because, oh yeah. I mean, be, the explosion the has been, has been crazy over the last, so we started to go over, you know, worldwide in at the end of 2017. So this, this will be going on the sixth full year and the growth has been incredible. I mean, the growth in Brazil has been crazy. The growth in Japan has been crazy. The growth all over Europe, you know, South Korea, Australia, uh, the rest of South America outside of Brazil, you know, you know, Argentina and Colombia and all these different places. The growth is is insane. It's and it's such a good thing, you know, for the sport. And obviously, we're seeing it with top level athletes being from all over the world. I mean, before it was very very USA dominated. Yes, for sure. But now all over the world, I mean, I go to, you know, the the NPC Worldwide show in Dubai that we have, right? And, the, you know, only men can compete there. Right. And the quality of, of the guys, you know, from all these Middle Eastern countries is absolutely incredible. You know, and then it's like these are the guys that end up, okay, that win their pro card. No one really knows about them. Then they show up to some show and it's like, who's this guy that just won the show and qualified for the Olympia? Right. You know, they just, they just turned pro. But the quality get from all the parts of the world. And then obviously, again, it's like a whole ecosystem, the growth of the sport, the growth of the organizations, the growth of companies that are inside of this industry, right? So you have like this whole ecosystem of businesses that, you know, is part of the NPC and the, you know, the IPB Pro League. And that's that expansion, again, is giving the opportunities to so many people, you know, make their livelihood through this industry. There's so many. I mean, today during the uh, seminar, I had two or three different people come up to me and they were like, Hey, I want to know some things about coaching. Do you do any coaching? And I said, Hey, I'm working on a platform, but, and, um, but the crazy thing about it, I said, so what do you do for a living? And the guy says, I do coaching. I said, okay. And how many pro shows have you done or one or whatever? And the guy said, I haven't competed as a pro yet. And I said, okay, so that must be your side gig. Right, because I used to f have four jobs yeah. when I was coming up in the early two thousands. I had four jobs. I wrote for muscular development. I coached. I had a corporate nine to five job, and I also consulted. So, like companies like BSN, yeah, I consulted for. And so I'm just you know hustling, hustling through different um, just gigs that I was doing. But he said no full time, and I go full time. He goes, yeah, I live here in Dallas, and it, my full time gig is I'm a I'm a trainer. I said, oh, okay, which gym? And he goes, no, no, all online. And I'm like, whoa. You're doing your entire gig online. You haven't done a pro show. Um, and it's it's one of those things where, like you said, people are making good living doing this, but they just started with just doing amateur shows. He turned pro, wants to do his pro debut, trying to decide which one to do. Yes. But he makes a full living doing online coaching. And it's not some big famous influencer it's, you know, there's so many of these people and so many trainers and so many, you know, back in the day, it was just, I remember me coming up with Kimoto and it was me, Kimoto, a couple of others. I remember Chris Aceto, Chad Nichols. Um, who's that? Mike Davies. Oh, Mike Davies. That's right. Mike Davies. And then it was like, you had just some people coming up and I just remember that was it. Yeah. But it, I mean, like you said, the shows had 40 people, 50 people in them. Now, I mean, again, 
actually some coaches, you know, some coach actually in a lot of different sports, the best coach, the best athletes don't always make the best coaches, right? Right. But some people that really know what they're doing, they can come in. Are you trying to say I can't be top five at the Olympia? <laughs> <laughs> are, are you trying yeah, to give yeah. me some kind of subliminal message right now, Tyler? <laughs> that you're just looking at me going, wow, I'm not going to be able to get in the first call out. Yeah, but. Hottie, Hani, and Derek. And which, by the way, is, are you guys, am I the only one who sometimes, Steve, it sounds like he's saying Hani when he says Hottie? Because Jay Cutler pulled me aside a couple years ago. He goes, dude, he thinks you're up there. He kept calling <laughs> Hottie, Hani. And I was just laughing. He's just subliminally knowing, like, you're you're ready to come, like, say, I don't understand, Steve. What's going on? What <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? And then, actually, it would be your paw. And your paw would be like, I don't know. You know, he's kind of looking a little washed out. I don't yeah. know what's going on. You know, that's my worst Germanian uh, impression ever, <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's one of those things where you're right. It's just it's crazy how much things have changed. Yeah, you you, get, you don't have to be a great it, coach, like you said. Uh, to go back on your thought process, you don't have to be a great competitor to be a really good coach. Exactly. And there's so many people on there that can be able to do that. Yeah, and I mean, and as a coach too, as a single person, you can only take on so much. So there's so many people out there that obviously it, we're just talking about coaching alone now, but you can make you know, an amazing, whether it's your side thing or if it's your full business, I know so many people that are super, super, super successful with just, just their coaching business as well. And some people just with training, right? We're not even talking about diet and nutrition. Now, some people just with training, they got inside the industry, they competed, whether they're, you know, whatever kind of competitor they are through competing and through all this stuff, like networking and everything else through this industry and through the shows and everything like that, they make, you know, an awesome living, which is, what this whole, you know, what what these organizations are, they are a platform for people to make, you know, whatever they want out of their journey into the fitness industry. Yeah, you know, how many people are doing just posing? And they have, whether it's every 15 minutes, 30, it's usually, I believe, 30 minutes. Yes. And it's like they're doing online posing coaching. Sid Gillian. Yes. She does posing, and she's like like a freaking doctor that's got, like, check in, check out, boom, 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 like 10, 12, 15 people a day. And they don't understand that she has sponsors and she has all these other things, but she's also working. Yes. As And she doesn't do any coaching. She just does posing. And she's great at it. I give her a ton of you know referrals. But I'm just blown away because you have so many of these that people don't hear about. So many. Yeah, exactly. So many little things that you wouldn't even think of that people are making tanning, a, a living. It was like know, tanning doing. companies, um, makeup companies. Um, photography that people do, hair, right, hair, makeup, all yes. of those things. And then I'm sitting here going, wow, this is crazy because if you look at how much revenue and how many people make a living doing this, it's absolutely insane. And then on top of that, there's the influencer thing. There's influencers that don't compete that are crushing right now. You hear about them. My thing is that what's your thought process on those? Like, do, is that, do you, what's your, what's your feeling on that? that they come in the fitness industry and they influence and they 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 have a huge huge following but they don't compete. I mean again there's like I said there's parts of this whole entire industry that's for everybody. You know, you you can't just expect I think whether it's you expect to come in and become an influencer without competing that's going to be, you know, hit it off and be some major major influencer and you really you can't expect you're going to come in and be Mr. and Miss Olympia in any category. Right away, you have no idea where your journey is going to take you. I mean, I think, I just think being involved in the fitness industry as a whole is a great thing. Really, a lot of influencers end up coming back, you know, or contributing in some way or whatever, whether they're part of a business or own a business that is inside the fitness industry, mm -hmm. whether they never competed or not. So the more people that are involved in fitness and in the fitness industry, I think the better because that's how, again, everything grows. Even like, some, there's some influencers that, you know, they got, they made it big time, but they want to challenge themselves. You might never hear about it. Maybe they, maybe they don't even document it, but they want to go and get on stage just because they want to see, Hey, I'm already in shape and I did this and that, you know, there's been some times where there's been some kind of big influencers that got on stage and on their content, they look like they're in great shape, but no one ever, you know, knew they came and competed. So it's, I think it's just good as a whole for who, who, who you want to mention who that was? You're thinking no, 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 no. <laughs> no names, so, no so, names. so but what I'm saying is like, I think it's like a great thing for people to be involved and be in shape and be in the fitness industry because that's just the bigger, the bigger it gets and the more mainstream it gets, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, 
you're living a healthy lifestyle too. And I mean, my grandpa is about to be 80, you know, a week from now. Yep. And if you looked at him, would you think he's 80 years old? Not even close. And there's other people in their 70s that we know. I mean, uh, no, I won't say who else is in their 70s. But there's <laughs> other people in their 70s that we know, right? And he or she, you look at them, you would never guess they're that old because, you know, 15 years ago, you think of someone in their 70s, they're hunched over walking with a cane or a walker. But even you see it today, there's some people that are, you know, late 60s or 70, and they look like they're 10, 15 years older than my grandpa who's about to be 80. Why? He's made weightlifting a core part of his life since he was a teenager. So everybody that's worked out and does physical fitness, you're just going to be healthier, you know, way later on in life too. So I just think it's a good thing all around. It is. It is. And then there's people like me who look like I'm 80. And your <laughs> grandpa teases the shit out of me with it because he turns around. I remember I was 30 years old and I had somebody win the USA. I can't remember who it was at the time. And he turns around, he goes, you're 30? He goes, I thought you were like 50. <laughs> and I'm like, He's like, I'm just like, and I'm going to be 50 next year. And I just go, God, I probably look, I look older than your grandpa right now. You know, just from all the stress that these guys put me under. I used to have a full head of hair when I started training, you know, Phil, Phil, Phil Eve, you know, back in 2005. Oh, uh, you showed me that picture. I couldn't believe it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I showed everybody a picture. Uh, I, I might have to show it online, but I had hair down to my, probably about a foot down under my um, chin. It's not online, by the way. I never posted it. No, that that picture. That was a that was Photoshop from about <laughs> a year or two ago. That picture up there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but you know, it was uh, yeah. Uh, even with the one with Jay, I think that was 09, The one with J me and Jay Cutler. I had hey, there you go. That's me right there. That was back uh, when I was competing at the Ironman Nat NPC Ironman Naturally, the John Lindsay show. But um, but yeah, that one with the metric shirt on. God. And then uh, the more guys I took on, the more hair I lost. That was it. Yeah. That was it. It was just like <laughs> people were jumping off like Titanic. Like the hair follicles were like, if you ever watched the movie Titanic, yeah. you're jumping off the, you know, when the off ship the was boat, going down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that was my hair follicles. <laughs> just from stress. From stress. I won't name names, but uh, his initials, Phil Heath. <laughs> 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 it's a lot, but uh, but yeah, it was great being a part of these guys' journey. Well, um, Jay wasn't it wasn't easy either, but I think that the biggest thing is just being able to also uh, look at the, you know, speaking of bodybuilding, what I'm also seeing is influencers sometimes are going into more of the natural route, and I'm seeing. I always I had David Butler who was here uh, today at the event, and he won David Lieberman's show. And he did a natural Ohio yes. because I said, if I had that show back then, I would have done it, but I didn't know about it. So I did John Lindsay's show um, that was, uh, or John Balick. Uh, it was the Ironman naturally back when I was competing yeah. in the shows. And my thing is, I'm noticing that there's some, it seems like, is there more now? More natural yeah, shows? Yeah. So, so what we're doing yeah. is we're going to build up the, the natural shows as okay. well in the NPC. We added a lot more this year. I think there's going to be probably about 25 to 30 across the country. And then we have a pro qualifier which is called the Ben Weeder okay. Natural Pro Qualifier. It's in Virginia Beach. It's in uh, the third weekend of November, you know, every year. And, you know... And is that urine? Is that how they're testing it? Or is it different? It's going to be... It's So it's been urinalysis, but we're, we're going to do urinalysis combined with polygraph testing as well. Okay. So, you know, some shows regionally will be just urinalysis. Some will be just polygraph. It all depends on where, where you're at. But... We're going to really, you know, try to build that up. And like the penultimate thing is the Ben Weeder has a natural pro show where outside of 212 and men's and women's bodybuilding, the other division winners get to go to the Olympia every year. And these people look that good that you probably haven't even been able to tell who came from that show and made it to the Olympia. You know, they fit in in these call outs and look great. So what we want to do is kind of build up that natural side with more, you know, we're going to put a cap on it, but for every division, a certain amount of natural pro shows okay. that will qualify you to go to the Ben Weeder, right? Maybe we're going to put it probably at some point, either in the middle or on the or on the western side of the country, another natural pro qualifier, build up a little bit more regionally the natural pro shows and really give people an avenue to become an IFBB pro that way as well and also compete that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. I didn't realize it was there was that many. I had heard from someone who had told me, said, hey, I think Tyler wants to do one estate. So basically up to 50 of them, one per state. I would, I would love that, yes. Yeah, and I, you know, whatever I can do to help that, I want to be a part of. Because, again, I come from the natural bodybuilding route. Yeah. And, again, you have your choice as you get older, whatever, decide, you know, it's like 
going through and it's like your journey book, right? Yes. Adventure book. You can decide what you want to do. But I feel like this is something that would be really beneficial for those that really feel that they just want to stay that route. You have the ability to stay within the NPC and be able to do that. So I really want to be able to, to connect with you and get more information on which ones, if there's any in Texas. Um, yeah, yeah, Adela. Mm -hmm. Adela has, is going to okay. have a natural show this year, yeah. and Rich Palmer is going to have one. Adela's is in June, I think. And um, is, that, is that Austin? Yes. Okay. And Rich Palmer's will be in September in Beaumont. So, and we've had, you know, we've always had natural shows in the NPC, all, yeah. like throughout the country, but more sporadically, you know, placed and everything like that. But yeah, I think it's just, again, once competitors come here, like, you know, they think, oh, we're this, we're that, we're not going to be competitive in the NPC. That's totally false. Just last year, I went to the Emerald Cup. The Emerald Cup has the natural on Sunday. Like 55% of the competitors did the open show, and it was crazy the amount that came up to me on Sunday mm -hmm. after the natural part saying, wow, you know, we were told we would never do good here. We can never do this. We would never do that. Some of them won their classes at the normal NPC show, the open NPC show. How long has that been going on at the Emerald Cup? I didn't even know about it. Oh, man, it's been going on. I think, you know, Ivan Ribbig runs it now, but Brad Craig used to run it. I think they've been doing it for like 20 years. But that natural portion was part of it for yes. that long? Yeah, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Then they have another one up there, the Northwest Naturals, so... But yeah, I mean, once once these athletes come over, they see like, you know, they're competitive, like the best, you know, the best of the best. Obviously, they are competitive. They can do really well. And then, of course, once that we get, you know, get them in here in the NPC, we know that they're always going to want to compete here with everything that we have to offer. Absolutely. And like I said, I get hit up with a lot of the young LA athletes and they're like doing these random associations I've never heard of. Right. Yeah. It's just like cable channels, right? You know, W yeah. P P P and W K K K A and whatever else, right? Yes. And I, they're like, so what do you think? And I always kind of direct them to Dave's show. But knowing now there's even more and being able to be bi-coastal, both East Coast, West Coast, as well as Midwest, being able to do that is going to be awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, again, the people that, you know, want to have those goals of, of becoming the best that they possibly can be, right? To be able to go... And then, you know, right now what it's going to be is the Ben Weeder. You go there and you win that so show. So that's the Ben Weeder is like the Olympia. It's like the Super Bowl of, 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 the, of natural the natural events. Division. Yeah. Okay. And we added a lot more in Korea, the natural stuff, plus in Europe and other places. So we're going to get a worldwide contingent that's going to end up at the Ben Weeder, right? Okay. And to win that and go to the Olympia. Who I, won I, that last year? Who won the Ben Weeder? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have the, the, the list, list. Of, the I, list of I, names, I, yeah. but you should, I mean, Gilco was there videoing it. So okay, I'll go if you look. go and look on his page, you'll see like, wow, these, these athletes are super impressive. And they were at the Olympia. And the impressive thing is, is obviously. They were in the mix. You, you know, they're in it, whatever call out. And it's not like the person goes, you would have seen someone complain like, how'd this person get to the Olympia? You didn't see that in any of those classes. They, they fit in because they're that good. So anybody that's coming up the natural way, you're going to be able to compete that way and then also get a chance to still make it to the be all end all which is the olympia, the olympia. i think it's a super super cool thing it's a very cool thing i am like i'm actually more excited about hearing about this than i have a lot of things and hottie chopin just got here off the thing. <laughs> don't tell hottie but uh but yeah i'm so so excited about it but I, i'm really looking forward to getting more information on that but again tyler i know you got a flight i really appreciate you coming out here um, all the things that you guys are doing both domestically as well as internationally. Um, and by the time this comes out, your grandfather's birthday is going to be there. So happy yep. birthday to Jim Mannion on the big eight O that's coming up. So again, uh, we wouldn't all be here without you. And, um, I'm hoping to get him on to the podcast because there is so much, there's so many things that I know that he's done for so many people that have been that's under wraps yes. just because he doesn't go out there and tout it but i know about it i know so many people that talk so much crap about the association about your family about this and that that literally got their pro cards because of jim yeah and it just drives me crazy because i i have to say it i was there when it happened you know and it's just one of those things where i want to be able to be able to sit down with him and just say number one thank you because he has gone so far out of his way for this and i feel like it's just continuing to grow 
And now with you here, I, you know, looking forward to seeing what else you have coming on, uh, the corporate sponsorship and everything else. And, um, like I said, I'd love to bring Jim on. Uh, we'll try to get him on, but yeah, I mean, talking about him, that's the reason obviously that I'm here. Right. And I take it so seriously that, you know, he literally and figuratively. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> he, you know, he took on the legacy of Joe and Ben. Yep. Right. And then he, you know, he has created and helped so many people. It's actually unbelievable when you think about it, the amount of lives that he's touched in some way, right? And what he's done to help cert- like help so many people, right? He's just, you know, a very, very generous person, but also, you know, he's not one that wants someone to go out there and say this and that and whatever. So, you know, to follow in his footsteps, like, it, me- it obviously means a lot to me, but also, like, yeah, I think he he actually doesn't get nearly the credit that he deserves for let's be you know honest really creating this ecosystem like he you know he himself started the mpc you know he took the you know took over the pro league from the weeders but he created the mpc which it's fed into the pro league and all these businesses and all these you know this whole industry all this stuff exploded all while he was you know at the top running running these these organizations which you know again you can there's some people they'll they'll flat out tell you like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jim Mannion and Jim Mannion what he did with you know with the MPC so yeah that would be cool to get him on he I'm not a you know I don't I don't go on very many podcasts to do podcasts and anything and he's even more than that he never wants wants to go on but maybe we'll be able to convince him that would be awesome because like I said there's a lot of really good stories and um, just ones that he's been a part of in terms of in person where I've had a personally shared with him at North Americans in 2005 and we were in um, we were in Ohio and just stories upon stories and then there's ones where just I know behind the scenes about what he's done for so many of these pros that really needed help and yeah. um, that couldn't or couldn't get pro cards in international countries and he's like that's bullshit no way he made a few phone calls and he got the person pro card and the person start, competed a week or two later yep and again, I don't want to go into too much detail of those stories, but I do know them and they are just absolutely you just change these people's lives. And I just feel like there's been a lot of those that because he doesn't go on podcasts, he doesn't do these things. I would love to be able to highlight some of those things because, again, I know about him personally. And it would be really cool, yeah, for everybody to hear about him, too. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you so much, Tyler. Hani Rambod, Tyler Mannion, and that's the truth. <laughs>